so far. Amen, church? You know, uh, growing up in the 60s, you know, my bands were, you know, the Beatles and the Beach Boys. However, as I've aged, I've, I've come to even appreciate country music. And there's a song that I think is perhaps most appropriate that I heard a, a few years ago by Randy Travis entitled Three Wooden Crosses. A farmer and a teacher, a hooker and a preacher, riding on a midnight bus bound for Mexico. One was heading for a vacation, one for higher education, and two of them were searching for lost souls. The driver never ever saw the stop sign. And 18 wheelers can't stop on a dime. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. I guess it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. The farmer left a harvest, a home, and 80 acres. The faith and love for growing things in his young son's heart. And the teacher left her wisdom in the minds of lots of children did her best to give them all a better start. And that preacher whispered, can't you see the promised land? As he lay his blood-stained Bible in that hooker's hand. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. I guess it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. That's the story that our preacher told last Sunday. As he held that blood-stained Bible up for all to see, he said, bless the farmer and the teacher, and especially the preacher who gave this Bible to my mama, who read it to me. Now there are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, now I guess we know. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. Today, we're going to talk about Golgotha's three crosses. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. We pick up the passion account. In verse 32, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Right here we find that Jesus is taken to Golgotha. Now, very interestingly, Golgotha comes from an Aramaic word, very similar in sound, Golgotha, which means the skull. In Greek, it's translated Karanion, where we get Karanium. And in Latin, it's translated Calvary, where we get Calvary from. So we find right here a very ominous scene. Jesus, beaten and bloodied, is so beaten up that he doesn't even have the strength to carry his cross all the way up the mountain that's outside the walls of Jerusalem. And the Bible says right here that Simon is plucked from the crowd to carry Jesus' cross. And what we must have seen right outside those walls of Jerusalem would have been a hill that literally had the face of a skull. And there on top of that hill were erected the three crosses. It's very interesting to me that the Bible simply says the two robbers were crucified with him, 
one on his right and one on his left. Now that phrase is used in all the Gospels in a different setting. Because there's another setting where Jesus is begged by some, can we sit at your right or at your left? And of course, Jesus says, only my Father in heaven knows who that will be with me in glory. Well, this is when Jesus is glorified. Who is at the right and the left of Jesus? It's those who are crucified. Continued in verse 44. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour, about noontime, until the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., darkness came over the land. So this was not an eclipse. An eclipse lasts for a few minutes. We are talking darkness in the Middle East by the very hand of God. About the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus' drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. And the rock split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of any holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, he went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is an incredible scene. As ominous as the skull hill is, we find the Bible says that in the middle of the day at noontime, everything becomes dark. And it's dark for three hours until Jesus' very last moments. The Bible says when he dies, he cries out in a loud voice and he gives up his spirit. Now inferred in this, is that the very moment that Jesus dies, the darkness disappears and there is light once again. Then the Bible says the people there on Golgotha were situated in such a vantage point that they could see the opening of the temple. And the temple had a curtain. And the Bible right here says what they saw after everything became light, so they could see everything, is that the very outside curtain of the temple was torn top to bottom, meaning that God grabbed it and ripped it. Now, Josephus says the curtain was four inches thick. What does this imply? Well, this is amazing. No longer is there a blockage to go in to be in the very presence of God in the temple, but now God has taken away any blockage and access of him by the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then it says, if that wasn't enough, the earth starts to shake. It's an earthquake. This wasn't just a minor earthquake. We're talking about right here, the rocks are splitting. There's an explosion. <laughs> then, if that's not enough, the tombs open up and people are resurrecting from the dead and just walking out of the tombs. And then the Bible says, when the centurion and everybody else on that mountain had seen all of this, they go, surely he was the son of God. You know, it's a very interesting perspective right here. Let's look at Mark's in chapter 15. In verse 37. We read, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. So Matthew shows how the whole crowd reacted. Mark centers solely on the centurion and has him situated right in front of Jesus, seeing how he died. When God turns the lights on, the earthquake comes, the curtain is split, the holy people rise from dead, he goes, surely 
This was the Son of God. Now let's go to the book of John. In John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because Jesus didn't want, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given his testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. This is John speaking. These things happen so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Right here we find, when we put together Matthew's account and Mark's with John, we find that Jesus' last words were not a whimper, but with a loud cry. And he simply looks up at him and says, It is finished! And he dies. So we have a timeline right here. Because when the soldiers come, because they want to take the bodies down because of the Passover coming, they see that Jesus is dead, so they don't break his bones. But to each of the thieves, they break their leg bones. It's called crucifracture. So that they would die quickly by suffocation. So we know that when Jesus died and the light comes on, the earth shakes, the temple curtain is torn in two, and the dead people rise from the tomb. The two thieves saw it. So now we go on to Luke chapter 23. Verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. This is kind of fascinating. As many of you know, Luke is a doctor. So he does not use the Aramaic term, but he uses the Greek term simply the skull or cranium. Now there actually is another term in the Greek for the cranium and the mandible. But our doctor, who is going to be anatomically correct, amen, <laughs> says the hill looked like the top of a skull. And there, Jesus is crucified with the criminals. We read on. 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man's done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. She said to him, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Interesting. The two criminals. Same circumstance. Same death sentence. Totally different responses. Your circumstance has nothing to do with whether your heart is going to respond to Jesus Christ. Golgotha's three crosses. Well, the first cross is Jesus. He died for sin. The second cross is the thief that doesn't repent. He died in sin. And the third cross is the thief that repents. He died to sin. And those are our three points this morning. Jesus died for sins. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 
Verse 3. Paul says to the church of Corinth, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as the one I'm normally born. For I am the least of the apostles, don't even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Amen. Right here, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. It is the good news, and it is the motivation that one must have to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, the thing that separates Christianity, true Christianity, from all other religious philosophies is the resurrection of Jesus. When you look in the tomb of Muhammad, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb of Buddha, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb of Confucius, you'll find his bones. But when you look in the tomb of Jesus, it is empty. He has risen. Are you with me right here? I don't know about you, but I've been praying super hard for the Sydney mission team. And uh, it has been extraordinary how the spirit has begun to move in this nation. You know, we found out just a couple of weeks ago, they had their first baptism, a young Aussie young lady named Tegan. Now, she came from an atheistic background. But when she read the scriptures and came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus and that Jesus had died for her sins, she was baptized into Christ. <laughs> then, then a young man from... Malaysia comes forward, and he was from the Islamic religion. Of course, his name is pretty emblematic of that. His name's Muhammad. <laughs> but after he came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he too found the motivation to be baptized into Christ. And I think it's good that we finally baptized Muhammad, don't you? <laughs> then last Wednesday... Another young man comes forward from the nation of Sri Lanka. His name is Kim Vendu, and he's Buddhist. He comes to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and therein finds the motivation to be baptized into Christ. And Joe says, bro, I'm pretty sure we just found the leader of the nation of Sri Lanka. And then earlier today on Easter morning, we had a young Chinese sister baptized into Christ. Oh, yeah, she's from the land of Confucius. You see, Muhammad, Buddha, and Confucius did not rise from the dead. Only Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is the only way to God. Let's continue reading 1 Corinthians 15. You see, Paul shares quite strongly right here. He says, his grace to me was not without effect. I'm just going to ask some of you that are visiting today for the first time, has God's grace had an effect on you? Are you willing to start studying the Bible? And for some of you that have been studying the Bible for a week, two weeks, two months, two years, Why hasn't God's grace had an effect on you? I mean, look what's in store. Chapter 15, verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised the imperishable, and we will be changed. That's pretty exciting, Amen. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable is clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where on death is your victory? Where on death is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Right here he says, in the light that we, through Jesus Christ, will enter heaven with a changed body. And that's good news for all of us, I think. <laughs> he says, in the light of our victory over sin and the death, he says, let nothing move you. Don't let anything shake your faith. But always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. You know, this has been a terrific week in the City of Angels Church. Uh, earlier in the week, we had a restoration and three other baptisms. That means this week in the church, we will have had two restorations and... 15 baptisms. But you know, as we look back on the year, basically our church is having daily baptisms. In other words, about seven baptisms a week. Maybe with today, it's eight. But we have to understand what that means. We have a hardline membership of about 800 disciples. And we're saying that so far this year, and believe it or not, it's almost one-third of the way over. So far this year, that means that every week, it takes a hundred of us to have one baptism. Really? Really? A hundred sold-out disciples have one baptism. You know, I love this church. This is an incredible church. Last year, you sent out 86 to the mission field. This year, we'll send out over 70 to the mission field. That said, there are many disciples that are not rising up out of the appreciation they have of God's grace. I think we have many disciples that are distracted. I mean, ask yourself, did you have a visit this week at Bible Talk or Church Today? Have you been personally fruitful this week? I pray that those questions are not offensive to you. Right here, Paul says, the grace of God was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Who is the all of them? It's the other apostles. He's saying, that's how much I appreciate the grace of God. I really believe there needs to be a call to repentance in the city of Angels Church when it comes to pure, unadulterated evangelism. And I want to challenge everybody that has not been consistent bringing business, that has not been fruitful this year, to repent. Why? Because Jesus died for your sins, and the grace of God needs to motivate you. Amen? Let's talk about the thief that did not repent on the cross, he died in his sin. And if you die in your sins, you are lost for eternity. You know, it is amazing to me. He saw everything the centurion saw. He saw everything the other thief saw. But his heart was unmoved. He continued to insult Jesus to the end, whereas the other criminal had begun with insults, but then had a change of heart. Amen. You know, this past Christmas, Elaine and I had the joy to have all the children and, and grandchildren come to L.A. for Christmas. And our son, Sean, and his wife, Alex, wanted to get a few days away, so, hey, we'll take care of our 15-year-old granddaughter. And, you know, it's kind of tough to think, what, what are cool things to do with a 15-year-old? Well, of course, one of the things is going to the movies, right? And I looked at some of the movies being played, and I go, no, we shouldn't go to that one. No, we can't go to that one. Mm, no, can't go to that one. 
So finally, I saw an animated movie called Frozen. I go, that's the one we're going to go to. And not only did she love it, but I loved it. I loved it so much that I went out and bought the DVD. And I've, I've got to be open. I, I've, I've, I've seen it five or six times. I mean, I know all the songs, you know, Let It Go and The First Day of Forever, Want to Build a Snowman. And I, I was going, why do I like this movie so much? I had a very eerie thing happen to me almost three weeks ago now. And I don't, I don't know about you, but... When I sleep, I, I don't think I dream very much. Now, my wife, Elena, we're talking almost every night. But me, I usually hit it, that's it. And I can't say that this particular dream that I had was from God or was just a psychological crisis, I don't know. But the dream was in Technicolor. And Elena and I, it opens up, Elena and I are just seated on the plane watching everybody board. And then in comes two men who I knew in our former fellowship. And who had, in my personal perspective, hurt myself and my family very much. To my shock, in the middle of the dream, I get up and confront the first one. I just go off. <laughs> and then, even greater shock, the other one, I don't even look at. I don't even say a word to. And then I woke up. And I go, maybe I haven't dealt with all my bitterness. Maybe the reason I like that movie so much is I have the frozen heart. And then, just surreal timing. A few days later, one of the sons of the man that I didn't even speak to, he dies. Elena writes a nice note and she goes, honey, aren't you gonna write a note? Well, babe, you, you've written one for us, I think. And, <laughs> and you know, if I was him, I don't know if I'd want to hear from me. Remember Hebrews 3.12, sin is deceitful. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, the more I saw I had a frozen heart. Now, in the movie, and I'm not going to ruin it for you, The way to unthaw a frozen heart is with an act of love. And I knew what I needed to do. I needed to write an email expressing my love and compassion and even appreciation for the better times I'd had with this person. Sad to say, it took me three days. But when I did it early that Tuesday morning, it was amazing. Just like in the movie, I could feel my, my heart unfreeze. Amen. It was incredible. Turn with me to John chapter 13. Jesus says in verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As you've loved me, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The Bible is emphatic that if we do not love one another, yes, like one another, we are not disciples of Jesus Christ, and the world will see no testimony from our lives. You know, there are a lot of organizations that gather large groups of people. So just because we have a two- or three-hour meeting every so often, that's nothing special. What makes us special is that we love and we like each other. 
I, I've just got a question. Do you have a frozen heart towards any brother or sister? Is there someone that you just want to get up to and they go, I can't believe you did that to me. <laughs> or worse, is there someone you don't even want to get close to, you don't even want to eye lock with? I'm very concerned about you because your sin has deceived you. You have a frozen heart just like the thief that did not repent even though he saw all the miracles. If we are going to evangelize this world, this is the smallest God's new movement is ever going to be. And if we can't love each other in this tiny group, how in the world will we love each other when God's movement is hundreds of thousands of disciples in all the nations of the world? Our third point is the thief that repents. He died to sin. Sometimes I'm asked, well, this guy wasn't baptized. Well, of course he wasn't. Jesus on the cross, he's going to die for the sins of the world. And he had the power as the son of God to forgive sins. But let's go on over to Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, of course, Paul's addressing all the disciples in the city of Rome. And he says in verse 2, We died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see, baptism is... is it's not just symbolic. It is the actual sharing by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, this is, this is pretty incredible when you think about it because we understand that it's the blood of Christ that forgives us. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. But we've got to ask ourselves a question. Well, where do we contact the blood? And secondly... We know that we got to be born again. We're, we're not going to kill ourselves physically. So how can we die? Both of those answers lie in New Testament baptism. The first one is simple. When you share in Christ's death, well, where did Jesus shed his blood? When he died. And to be born again, when you share in his death, then you die to your old self and you are resurrected you are raised to walk in newness of life and you are born again of the water and the spirit are you with me right here guys you know that that young lady that was baptized in sydney this morning did come from a buddhist background and yet over time she'd come to believe in the resurrected jesus and so she found the church over the internet and when she came to the church and seen the service, she was asked by one of the disciples a little bit about her background. She says, well, I'm a Christian. Well, not really, because I've never been baptized. And so they studied with her. They called her to repent to become a disciple. And she was baptized this morning into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And she, Maggie, is now your sister. You know, I dare say there are a lot of people in America, and I dare say even in the audience this morning, that at first ask, well, what is your spiritual life? Well, I'm a Christian. But in the back of your mind, you're going, well, but maybe not really. I want to challenge you. Study the Bible with the person you came with. Be eyes wide open. Get rid of those traditions that block your sight. And come to see that you've got to be crucified with Christ in order to join him in resurrection and in heaven. Are you with me right here? You know, I really believe that the reason you're here this morning is not just because you got invited, but that God appoints the exact places and times. Acts, check, Acts chapter 17 so that you will seek God, reach out for him, and find him. 
You know, back in our former fellowship, this was quite obvious with the baptism of two individuals. This is back in 1996. And these two individuals, one was a man named Stacy and the other a woman named Lynette. They, they had two little boys at that time, but they were not married and they lived a long ways apart. Well, what happened was very simply this. One day, the sisters in the South Central region were door knocking. And they came to Lynette's door, I believe, in the city of Downey, and says, hey, do you want to come to Bible study tonight? She goes, yeah, I guess I'm not doing anything. Sure, I'll come. And so she came. At almost the same time, down in Orange County, Stacy's neighbor asked him to go to Bible study. And he starts studying. So the next weekend, Lynette, who probably still had a little bit of a frozen heart, a little bit of an attitude towards Stacy, says, well, Stacy, are you going to visit the boys this Sunday? He goes, well, no, no, I can't. I, I start studying the Bible, and um, I'm going to church on Sunday. So what's she thinking? Oh, he's going after some girl at that church. <laughs> or he's just flat telling me a lie. <laughs> That's where the relationship was at. She says, well, what church are you going to? <laughs> he goes, I think the name is uh, LA International Church of Christ. She goes, no, that's my church. <laughs> and so they were each baptized a couple weeks later into Christ in 1996. <laughs> but they still were in their separate regions. And Stacy was a little bit more faithful visiting the boys. Finally, about two years later in 1998, a young minister at the time named Chris Klopek pulled Stacy aside. And he says, Stacy, you, 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 you're, you're, the mother of your children was just baptized a couple years ago, right? He goes, yeah. He says, don't you see it? See what? Don't you get it? God has brought you both into the kingdom so you can be married and do it right and raise these kids in the Lord. Stacy goes, I never thought of that. So they were married in 1998. A few years Later, sadly, they began to drift in their faith, and they fell away. Stacy said he became bitter that he wasn't used more in leadership, and they'd made a move to a different part of the L.A. church, and so they, quote, didn't know anybody. And so they began to drift. Well, fast forward to this year, early this year, and they're now a 14-year-old daughter because they had a third child, named Cameron, came to Stacy and said, you know, Daddy, I've been thinking a lot about God and heaven, and I really want to be saved. He goes, well, you know, daughter, <laughs> if you're going to be saved, you have to get baptized. Well, well, well Daddy, will, will, will you baptize me then? Uh, well, I really can't because I'm personally not right with God myself. It was at that prompting of the Spirit that he began to go back to church and went to our former fellowship, but he said it was nothing like the church he was baptized in. He says, I've got to contact the guy that got it all started, that Chris Kopek. He looked on the internet, found Chris's number, called. Chris called him immediately back, and the next Sunday, they went to the AMS to worship as a family. After a few weeks there, they started worshiping in the South region because that's where they live, the Ubera family. And so excitingly, a little bit over a month ago, excitingly, Lynette and Stacy were restored to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> and you said, well, well, what happened to little Cameron, the 14-year-old that wanted to study? Well, she's getting baptized today. <laughs> 
along with her now 20-year-old brother, Christian, is getting baptized today. You see, when they enter baptism, they're going to die to sin and be resurrected to a new life. Is that exciting or not? You know, last Sunday, Elaine and I had the privilege of uh, being in Houston, Texas at the inaugural service for the Houston International Christian Church. And, uh, you know, for those of us, as I said, raised in the 60s and kind of in the 70s, Houston was famous for being the, the headquarters, the space center for NASA. And there was a very famous line that came out of, was popularized in the movie Apollo 13, because that particular space vessel got in huge trouble. And the astronaut calmly radios back, he says, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> well, it was pretty exciting because the 21 disciples there in Houston, with about 14 of us visiting, had 86 in attendance last Sunday. <laughs> And now, that powerful little group of sold-out disciples has a message. Houston, we have a solution, and that is Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? I hope that you got a bulletin as you came on into service today. It's an incredible bulletin written by Tim Kernan about uh, the planting of new churches. And it's cool Mission team picture right there, the Toronto mission team. But on the back is our newest rendition of the Crown of Thorns project. And it has been an exciting year. We've seen Gainesville have their inaugural service, Santa Barbara, Sydney, now Houston. Toronto team's gonna be sent out in May, amen. Then at the GLC in August, we've always been planning for the Dallas-Fort Worth team to be sent out. But we've moved up schedule for the Chennai India team to be sent out at the GLC. And then the grand finale for the year is the Moscow mission team is being sent out in December. Isn't that incredible? You know, for me, these mission teams are some of the greatest miracles to witness in our day. The planting of a true church of disciples that gives hope not just to a city, but a nation. You know, the last words of that song, there are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them? Now I guess I know. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. Come the end of May, I turn 60 years old. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. I see people getting bugged that they're turning 40. I go, oh. 60. You know, I look at the internet, you see, uh, this guy died when he's 58. This guy dies when he's 67. I'm going, I'm right in that, that, that kind of that, that banner area right there. And, and when you reach that, dare we say, pinnacle, you think about what this life is all about. There's only three things that are eternal. The word of God, the heavenly hosts, and the souls of men and women. And you've got to ask yourself, what are you going to leave behind when you go? You know, we have the missions contribution. May 18th, our goal is to get at least 20 times our Weekly pledge. And when Argo announced that there was a mild cheer, that's ridiculous. 
Your salvation, City of Angels Church, was wrought by those that came before you and sacrificed in missions contributions. That is why you have spiritual life. And yet, I think sometimes you get into a little bit larger congregation, you think, well, I'm in a really cranky congregation. I must be a cranking Christian. <laughs> it's all about the heart. You can be on the right side, left side of Jesus, but you can have a frozen heart or a heart that's died to sin. For Elena and myself, We've got our missions already done, and we plan to get more. We did hit a little bump a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, we turned in, in our taxes, and we did get our state back. But the federal, I had my ID stolen from me. And we're not going to get that back for several weeks. And so it meant, hey, we're going to have to push the retirement in. But when you think about it, for disciples, we don't retire. We're disciples the whole time down here, and then we go to heaven. Are you with me right here? And, you know, I've just, I just got to ask you, are you excited about the 20 times missions contribution on May 18th for the sending out of Toronto, of Dallas-Fort Worth, of tonight, and Moscow? You know, in the South region, Elaine and I were so blessed to, to be there alongside Ole and Leona, but it's so cool because we've had several disciples come on over from Ukraine and Russia in order to train here to be on the Moscow team. And I've had different people ask me, well, uh, who's paying for those people? They are. They paid for their ticket round trip and they're paying for all their living expenses while they are here. Way over 20 times. But that's how much they believe in the mission. That's how much they believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't believe it's just simply a matter of putting your money in the plate. I think any true disciple hungers to be on the front line. And so it's a great joy that Elena and I will have the privilege, alongside of the Rajans, to lead the Chennai mission team. Some people say, well, there's disease. There's poverty. It's a third world. Aren't you worried that something bad's going to happen? Listen, the mortality rate in Los Angeles is 100%. <laughs> it's already written. Whether you die in India or whether you die in LA, you're gonna die. And so the only question remains, it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you, it's what you leave behind you when you go. My question, are you ready to go to heaven? Thank you and God bless.